Let's get going. So I think everyone here at least knows who Ian is, but for those tuning in later who don't, uh, Ian is a great friend of the shop and local guide, member of Team Canada, um, and uh, in my mind, certainly one of the best fly fishing guides in all of Canada. So uh, Ian, welcome back. We've had you a number of times here. If anyone hasn't seen those videos, they should definitely go back and rewatch them. Tonight, we're going to be doing some of your favorite guide flies, the one that ones we brainstormed that part you two, part had. two part two <laughs> like you know you never know how good the sequel is yeah. unfortunately the star usually dies at the end of a sequel so hopefully <laughs> fingers crossed not that here but uh yeah we had to brainstorm today what uh, what you hadn't already tied in uh in the previous episodes so not to say that this is going to be of any lesser quality but uh we've we've shown a lot of your favorite patterns already on those previous videos yeah. this this will be fun um, I'll let you kind of run the show here. If anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to ask them as we go through this. Just use the chat box um, so we can keep the, the audio clean. So type out your questions and then I'll just relay them to Ian as they come up. And with that, I will throw it to Ian. Yeah, and I'm just gonna, you can um, just so get that uh, stuff lined up here to see if I get the vice, uh, the right camera angle. How's that look? If I add some light to that, how's that look, Chris? That pretty good? That looks good to me. All right, everybody can see it. Okay. All right. So welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, feel free to riddle me with questions. I'll try to talk through also how I like to fish them. Uh, the flies, um, I mean, we're going to be here talking about flies, but uh, as you know, as I, I would strongly say that presentation is much more important than flies. So while these are flies that I work really well for me, feel free to, you know, leverage them uh, as much and use them as much as you want. Um, I didn't invent a single one of these patterns. These are patterns I have borrowed or uh, completely, you know, patterns I've taken from multiple, actually world champions when I look at it and multiple top uh, competition anglers over the world. Um, and I use them for guiding. So they're um, guide flies to me. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, are like ammunition. The whole point being they're simple to tie. You're not emotionally attached to them, uh, meaning you're not afraid to cast into a, uh, an area where you might lose them. Uh, and so I think thinking around flies more as simple, multiple patterns in the same, um, in different sizes, but the same pattern uh, and multiple patterns with different beads and finding those confidence patterns for you. Uh, is the best way to go. You're way ahead of the game if you start thinking that way. A lesson. So the um, the fact that I'm running out of flies here is the reason I don't have that many different types of flies, uh, but I have a whole bunch of them in various sizes and things along those lines. These are by far no less uh, 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 effective than the ones I tied previously. Just uh, we didn't get to them or a couple we had tied on Instagram uh, uh, feeds that weren't recorded. Um, so you may have heard or seen these before. These are how I tie them. Doesn't mean it's the only way to do it, but let's get going. So I'm going to start with a couple Pertagons. Um, I think Pertagons are kind of, people are getting a little too in love with Pertagons. So Sorry, Ian, I think you muted yourself there. Uh, yep. Nope. You had it. There we go. Oh, yeah, uh, the vice muted me. <laughs> uh, uh, we lost you after was... uh, you, you're starting to badmouth paradigons and everyone was dropping. Oh, I wasn't badmouthing paradigons. I'm badmouthing. I love them as much. I'm going to tie them. Uh, I just say, just um, they got. I hate to say trendy, but they they've they've definitely uh, become much more uh, mainstream. Uh, they are super effective patterns. They come with, originally from Spain. Uh, I think Pertagon is Spanish for pellet or something like that. And I think that's the right way to think of them. So these are great flies, in my opinion, when you need to get a small fly down. So they sink very, very quickly. Um, it's the hydrodynamic of a fly that makes them most. So a fly with hackle is going to fish different than a fly without hackle. It's going to sink differently. These are, you know, smooth epoxy type flies that get right down really, really fast. So they're great on single fly rivers like the Grand, or if you need to get a small fly down or uh, fish multiple flies with small flies. So uh, Pertagons are really, really effective in that type of water. I don't like them in slow water for the first reason they sink too fast. They also don't have a, a, any movement in them. Not that that's a be, on a be all and end all for a fly, but that the type of water I tend to fish is, is you know, fast riffly water or deeper water when I wanna get down. 
but there's no rules. It's just, uh, that's how I tend to like them. I usually fish them in 16s and uh, 14s. I'm gonna tie 14s today because they're just easier to see. Um, you can get smaller 18s, 20s if you want, but generally I fish 16s and uh, 14s. I don't tie them big. Um, you could tie them, I guess. Uh, I actually, I don't think I've tied one over a 14, but uh, all, all, all for you if you wanna do it. Um, first one I'm gonna tie is a uh, fly that just, I mean, it's you work for me for, geez, a decade, uh, is the Rainbow Warrior Pertagon Edition. I have tied this, I think, on Instagram. I'll go through it pretty quick, but this is a fantastic fly. Uh, don't be afraid of it because it's flashy uh, on heavy fished waters like the Credit or the Grand or anywhere. Uh, it works really well in Pennsylvania. Um, it, yeah, it's flashy, but it, it is quite a natural looking fly and it, it will catch a lot of fish and wild fish too. I you know those are stocked. A lot of rivers can be stocked, but don't be afraid of it for wild fish. So silver bead, I got a Hannock 3.0 with a 14 size hook. I'll go three, three and a half. Two and a half and three on a on a 16 but again very don't uh be afraid of big beads on a small fly so if i need a really small fly i would have no trouble putting a three and a half mil bead on a 16 i've put four mil beads on 16s um they work really really well fish don't care about the bead size they really do follow the hook size so a big bead on a small fly doesn't really affect it okay and i'm also you'll notice i've got a slotted bead here on a what is it a Hannock? What's it? Uh, 230 BL. Uh, that's their standard wet fly hook. You could totally tie this on a jig hook. I do like my Pertagons not on jig hooks. Uh, I will use the slotted bead to invert. So it will fish upside down, just like uh, you would with a jig hook. Uh, I have said this on a couple of videos, but when you use the slotted beads, you can do two things with it. You can turn the vise upside down and you can see I can put my thread at a 45 degree angle or I can just hold it with my finger and kind of just wrap it also on a 45 degree angle. And what I'm doing, you can see once I get enough thread there, whoops, am I messing the fly? Is that working okay, Chris? Yeah, looks fine. Okay. Um, and you can see that I've locked in that bead, if you can see that, and it's sitting on top of the hook. So that gives much more room uh, between the hook eye and the hook point, whereas a jig hook would actually go down a little bit. And because it's sitting on top, it will invert. So when your flies get smaller, like a 16, this is a 14, it makes a bigger difference. You get better hook sets in my opinion, but jig hooks, I use them a lot. I'll use them today. Uh, they're still very, very effective. And you do tie on jig hooks. It's still really, really good. It's just, I like my protocols like this. You could use red thread or black, doesn't matter on this one. Um, I will be, okay. So, Coq de Leon, uh, kind of a standard for Pertagons. Uh, I would always look for, I wouldn't get hung up if it's dark light or whatever, but look for barring. So you just really want that uh, contrast. And I think that's what makes these really, really good tails for these. If you don't have it, use partridge. It works pretty good too, for the same reason. It's got barring on it. Grab a clump of it, like three or four. And I like to measure at the length of the hook. And then catch it in. No way we go. I wouldn't put any more than that. That's a little bit heavy on the tail, but life will go on. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it either. Um, if a fish starts counting how many tail feathers I have, we have a problem. So the key though here being not to over, don't overdo it with the thread. So if you put too many thread wraps on it, you'll make a thick body. So the secret of a Pertagon tied properly, in my opinion, the way the Spanish do it is a really, really thin body. So I'm using re relatively thin thread. I think it's uh, 14.0 or something like that. I don't want it too thin of a thread because it's a pain in the butt to, to wrap the bead. So just find your happy medium on that piece. Okay, and so for the underlayer, I'm using red holographic tinsel. I don't know, can you see that or not? I'll do this. All right, I'm gonna grab the tinsel. This is a small, Small size, you could use any size you want. It doesn't really matter because we're going to wrap it under the body. Okay. 
And the second is that Pearl Vivas. Pearl. So I don't like the uh, the kind of opaque um, that Chris, you probably what's it called? Mirror flash, opaque or whatever like opal? that. Opal. That's it. I don't want the opal. I really want the pearl uh, because the pearl is a, you can see through it a bit, and we want that red to come through underneath. The original Rainbow Warrior I think was tied with red thread. I do find the holographic graphs a bit more light. So pearl on top of it. Okay. And I've tied both in. And sorry, just one sec. I'm just gonna yell over to my wife here. Hey Dill, I'm just I'm live here. Can you just move it along? You're just totally distracting me. All right, back to it. Um, so I'm gonna tie this in. Okay. And I'm gonna wrap the holographic underneath. You can see I'm not losing any, whoops. Don't grab the pearl. I wouldn't lose like, if I don't have perfect thread wraps or anything like that, it doesn't really matter. And if you're really worried about it, use red thread because it won't show through. I just need a little bit of red flash in there. there. And Ian, uh, Mora was asking if you've ever tried uh, inverted beads as opposed to slotted beads. Uh, uh, I haven't because I can't use them in competitions, but they work really well. Is yeah. from what I hear. Like, inverted beads ones that kind of sit on the top of the hook. Yeah, I, I think it's talking about like the style where it's, uh, it's almost like a, a bead and then separate to that, like a, a little loop on the end of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would be the same concept. We're just not allowed to use them. So I kind of do skew for everything that I do is, is uh, uh, just geared for what I'd use in competition. Yeah, I've so, never personally had an issue like with these not inverting. So no, yeah, you know, it, it works the same. Yeah. It's the same ones. I mean, again, I think both would work. It, it's the same end result, but, but if it's easier to slide that on and just for personal, go for it. Um, and uh, when I do clip off, I do tend to clip, there's, it leaves a little, the slot there, I kind of tend to clip any excess into that slot just to make sure it's a clean fly. So there's two ways to do the next piece. So I'll, I'll show you one way with this fly and then the next one. Um, so, you know, tie off here. I'm not gonna add any glue or anything. Sorry, you muted yourself again there, Ian. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. The voice. Yeah. Let me try this. This is, I do this quite a bit. It's not, I don't know what's going on here. Let's try a new position right over there. Well, that seems a little far away, doesn't it? Let's try it like that. Okay, still good? I'm not, I'm not muted? Yeah, you're fine now. All right, cool. Sorry about that. Um, so I could just be done with the fly right now and kind of, you know, UV it. Um, I will add, uh, I do think this makes a difference. I have fished them both ways is to put a, a black, call it a wing case, call it whatever you want, but a little bit of a black hot spot on it. You could use Sharpies. People use all kinds of things. I'm just going to use nail polish, black nail polish. The only pain is you got to kind of tie a bunch of these, let it dry. But I just take it and right on top of that bead, right where it connects. So I just put a little dab of nail polish and you can see when I turn it, that that actually makes quite a difference. It does stick out quite a bit and makes a, it'll, you will catch more fish on it. I do think that black wing, like a wing case, like a dark wing case or some type of contrast like that, many times like we use a hot spot. Uh, it does mean something to the fish. It's a trigger point um, or something along those lines. I think that is a way, in my personal opinion, uh, how they maybe identify like a nymph coming through is actual food because they see, see that little little hotspot wing case. Um, I was actually leafing through George Daniel's book, his original one, Dynamic Nymphing, I think it was called. And I noticed half of his flies he had put all 
wing case is on, same kind of idea, like wing case, wing case, wing case. So this little hot spot when you don't have a black fly is, is a good one to have. Um, so I'll just quickly, I mean, I think we've all seen the UV kind of piece, but I'll, I'll just give it a quick piece. So just, you know, try your best to keep it thin. Again, we worked hard to keep that thin. I do go over that little wing case I put on there and that's just for durability, meaning durability and the fact that it doesn't wash off. You could, as I said before, totally use a Sharpie for that. And there we go, good enough. I'll hit that with the light and we are off and running. So here's a question, Ian. Um, I agree with the wing case piece. I think it, it makes a difference. But um, one thing I've never considered is that a lot of our other nymphs don't have wing cases, so like the hare's ears and the pheasant tails and things that we tend fish. Yeah. A lot of them have wing cases. Have you ever tried this on those, just on the bead? I have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I, I find the hare's ear, eh, uh, I don't bother with it. I, do, I have done it quite a bit on pheasant tails. Okay. Yeah, so what I'm gonna show you next is what I do. Okay. For those, for those flies. And I actually do it on my hair's ears as well, because you're very astute. <laughs> so I'll show you, I'll show you that one uh, as well. So good. That's a good catch. So that's the, uh, the old rainbow warrior. Oh, on. Yeah. And you can't really see it in that light, unfortunately, but uh, this thing is, is just cool looking once you see it in person. It's got yeah, that it, what it, what it to it. Yeah, it flashes. There's a fly called the traffic light uh, buzzer from the UK. It's the same idea. It flashes like a traffic light to them, but it goes between kind of red and kind of a nat and then silver flash. And it just, you know, Gary Lafontaine with the with all the antron, you know, catching the bubbles. I think that little glint. I think a lot of times eat the. It's just got a really nice glint, and it's not. I know we look at it as it being, you know, it's very not natural, but it does look like it's not a stick, it's not a stone. So fish are very binary. They're thinking food, not food. They're not going, gee, I wonder uh, which pattern that was, you know, none of that. It's just food, not food, not food, not food all the time, right? And uh, that, you know, that little glint, food. Now too much, you know, they see flashy patterns all the time, they're kind of done with it. Um, the next fly is kind of in the same vein. So it's, uh, it's got quite popular in the last year or so. If you haven't heard of it, it's called a gasolina. Um, and this fly was shown to me years ago by David Arkai, uh, who uh, I would call him a friend of mine. Um, and when he was staying with me, and when I asked him if you could fish one fly for the rest of your life, what would it be? And he kind of hummed and hawed between a pheasant tail and this fly. And turns out he actually invented this fly, but it's getting a lot of traction these days. It's very popular in the US right now. Um, it's not uh, why it's called gasolina, Spanish for like gas. Uh, and what the, when the color they're looking for with it is that color if you have gas or oil in a puddle in that kind of coppery olive uh, reflected color. Um, I do tend to tie this only with a copper bead. Uh, I do tie the other one, uh, sorry, the uh, Pertagon only with a silver bead. I do rotate beads with a lot of things. That is fine. It works well. I don't really need to change it. You could go ahead and change the bead on this. I just don't. Um, so I'm going to use black thread again. I put a bit of a bigger bead on this, a 3.3 mil bead. Again, I'm using not a jig hook. Same hook as before. Again, I tie them 14s and 16s. This is a really good pattern uh, locally here as well. Like really good. Uh, there are days when it, 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 I've taken some really big fish on the grand uh, with this fly. Um, so, okay, gasolina, same idea. I could either invert the bead, do this at a 45 degree angle. Again, this is why I don't use super, super thin thread, just because I'd be here for forever, or I can just pinch the, the bead and do that. Your pig. So I guess Moro has a point. If you want to be faster, <laughs> use those inverted beads, but same idea. Mute it again. <laughs> I've now watching. solved the problem. It's when I push on the vice. Yeah, so. I'm just watching the corner of your screen now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just don't tell me the next time I'll just ramble on, but thank you, sorry about it. Okay, so vertigons are very similar. So I'm going back just past where they feed them if there was a barb. Um, 
I'm trying to get away. I was tying mine a little bit short. I think they're better with kind of the long, thin body. So I'm going to kind of pass the hook bend. So you can see where the thread is hanging, right where there would be a bar. Um, so let me, uh, I'll put in the tail. It's the same. I don't, I again, don't get hung up on which color of Pertagon. You know, you'll see flies while well. I use a light or a dark. I just go with, again, barred. It's barred. It's good enough. It's a little tail. You could probably not tie a tail and be fine. Um, I wouldn't overwrap it again because we're trying to keep it thin. Now, the, the, the gasolina is, you know, shrouded in mystery of what, it, what was used for the body. Um, I have a good authority from David. He had some material given to him that he didn't know exactly what it was and really liked the color of it. Um, what's replicated with is a lot of uh, people use hens brand uh, 245 mixed with 233 is one that gets used a lot. Um, but you could also go in with like your flashaboo, um, like if you can find um, peacock flashaboo, I even will pull apart one of these. I think, uh, you know, it kind of kinds of this diamond braid stuff. This is root beer. If I actually take this apart, this gives you the same idea. So you can take it, you can take it apart like this and actually just pull a, pull strands of it up and you end up with a pretty good looking little strand to wrap. So this diamond braid stuff, you guys sell us a drift. I mean, do you diamond braid? Thank you. Yeah, that yeah. diamond braid stuff works really good for Pertagons. You can play around with all kinds of colors with it. I used to use the um, the medium brown for this. And it yep. worked pretty nicely. They've changed the color though. It's a lot darker now. Uh, I haven't tried the new one. It, it might be good still, but the root beer, it's, it's a good idea. Yeah, it works good. And again, and so I'll do the kind of OG way of doing it here. But again, don't get like, it's not magic. Like, you know, gee, I don't have the right hens material. Then the gasoline is not going to work. Um, again, uh, um, the guy who invented the fly couldn't remember the exact material, but he said it kind of looks like gasoline, right? So what you're looking for is that kind of coppery green. Uh, I think the key being not just that dark peacock green, because uh, I do tie them with that and it works as well. But the feedback I got from the creator of the fly was, ooh, it has to have a bit of copper in it as well. So it really is that kind of coppery color. So whatever that means to you, but don't go overboard on, I have to have the exact material because we're chasing the wrong thing. Then we're, we're not, again, it's mainly the drift anyways. We just need um, a fly that'll get down. But this has kind of got a natural kind of look to it. So I put a couple pieces of the 233 in there and I'll put one of the 45. And if you don't know the hens brand, it's a, I think it's check. Um, the colors, the, they number them. But when we say a 45, it looks a lot like our peacock ice dub color. And if you hear the term 46 hens, that's a lot like just a dark black peacock color with a more green in it. Um, so you, you with a, when I tie a lot of flies, you'll hear, you know, a lot of international flies will say hens 46 or hens 45. That's all they mean when they say that. One other, uh, just remember Dan as well, I've been using recently. I think this is one of the closer ones I've found. It's just the hens paradigm tinsel as well. This is a, it's the color code. It's the 30. Can't remember what that actually means. They have one, it's called black copper that I always thought, oh, that sounds like it'd be really close. And it's not at all. Um, I can't remember what they call this, but all right, yeah, another one we have. Yeah, so, yeah, so all I'm doing is twisting this. Um, and again, you can see, like, just find ones you like. Uh, it's a great when you get into the Pertagon stuff, you can kind of just start messing about with what you, you think is going to look good on a fly and get a little creative now. I've bung this up on the tail, but I think it's going to still work. All right, bung it up too much. Get that. All right, I'm going to wrap it. And again, I don't lose a lot of sleep if it's not wrapped perfect. I just don't care. Like there's, if, if you miss a little bit, a little bit of black in there, who cares? And so that looks pretty good to me. So wrap it off like that. Find up the tail a little bit, but life will go on. So here's the, the trick I, I would will show you. So again, I cut it off in that little news uh that's that's kind of what we're looking for if it comes through on the camera but it's it, it's just a mix of kind of coppery green peacocky kind of color um okay so 
Chris, this is what I had mentioned of, here's what I do on that contrast piece or the wing case um, for the pink bead hairs here that I love so much. I do do this. Uh, I do some where I've wrapped up wing cases. I definitely do it on my um, pheasant tails, uh, much like I do a hot spot. So all you do is you take some super glue, take your favorite brand, put a bit on the bead right where you'd wrap it up. And then just, you can wrap up the bead and it could put a bit of a collar on this. And that, Chris, works pretty good. See how I'm wrapping up the bead? And so it'll stick, you can go pretty far up the bead. And then, so to me, when I'm tying a nymph, that's good enough. So I just made it, made it like a half, half the bead of black thread. That's a little trick to get that same wing case effect without on your regular nymphs. Clever, I like it. Yeah, it works really, really well. So you can see, same idea. And like the fish is gonna care. What it's doing is just flashing that little black spot. So really neat little trick uh, for any nymph you have if you want. So, so hot spots don't always have to be orange. Black is a really good contrast hot spot. Like, you know, black's the new orange. It's the opposite of orange is the new black, I think. So don't be afraid of black hot spots. That's a really big contrast. Um, that can make a big day. And you go, if you really want it, you go all the way halfway up the bead. So I'll just, I'll hit this quick just so you can see. I don't know if it comes through completely, but I'll give it a little a bit of the, the juice, but I probably almost overdid it there. So just be careful. So you see, I see a lot of vertigons kind of overdone. And, and I, by that, I mean, they're just too fat. And now I've fished many a fat pertagon and it works, but the thin, the old thin for the win is true. Thinner is better. And on that, uh, try to keep them as thin as within reason as possible. I would never add lead to a pertagon. You don't need it. You can just go bigger on the bead. And these things sink like stones, so. So there you go. There's another way to make the, the hot spot on it. And that is the famous gasolina. If you don't have them, I would strongly suggest those two. Um, that's why I tie one in copper, one in silver. I the way I think about it is the the silver pertiga or sorry, the um, rainbow warriors, my silver flash. This is my copper flash. That's it. And that's how I think about it. And it's, I don't really overdo it past that. So any questions on those two? Uh, nothing else that's come through. Um, yeah, it's kind of a shame. You can't really, again, with the light, perfectly see the color of those things. But maybe, Ian, I'll get you to uh, flip me a couple of photos of those flies that we can insert sure. in the video. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they, it doesn't do it justice. And it, they're even more when you put them in a glass of water. It's just, they, they just pop. So... Uh, I'm looking at them, they look great, but I'll send them your way for sure. All right, so that is the Pertagons. Um, so I'm gonna tie, all right, um, one more, actually I got one more Pertagon to go. Uh, this one's also really, really, really good. Um, I tie with a silver bead. Now there's a, if you don't know the guy, the name of Martin Droz, I think he's multiple world champion, kind of was the Michael Jordan of fly fishing for a while. Um, he lives in Australia now, but he's one of the top Czech anglers he's a fantastic guide and uh, just all around fishy guy um he gets credited i call this the martin droz nymph some people call it a france french nymph like not to be included with a frenchy but it nevertheless whatever it is in pertagon form uh it's absolutely deadly so black thread again mm. I won't say the same thing again, inverting the bead. I think everybody gets it. Okay, so same again, like recurring theme. You know, grab a chunk of well-marked Coctelion, 
And so the original fly of this was not a pertagon. I tie it in a pertagon. And there is a Spanish fly called a black widow. It looks very, very similar to this. Same idea, but it does uh, work really well. And I do only tie this one in a silver bead. Not saying you can't tie it in a copper. I'm sure it works really well. I just don't bother. So um, you just use the materials from the Rainbow Warrior. So here's the good news. You just take the red holographic. And so the, the Black Widow has the red at the collar. The Droz fly has it in the, on the butt. So I, I, I tied the original, which was, there you go, just a bit of red thread at the butt. Oh, sorry, not red thread, red holographic tinsel. And then I take this medium pearl and you just give it a stretch. And so it'll change a little bit of color, get a little bit of a bluish tinge to it. I'm not sure that makes that much of a difference. The original was tied with some weird tinsel off a doll um, and it tended to be more of a bluish color. So there was an old saying that went UV, but it doesn't really go UV, it just goes purpley. But if you give it that little stretch, you do get a bit of a different hue to it. So, and then all we're gonna do is wrap that sp evenly spaced so that, oops, try to get three in there. So you're wrapping over a black body now with that, not over the red. Yeah, that's right. So yes, you should come through is a black body ribbed with um, that kind of stretched pearl with a red hot butt. So I don't know if I do that. And this one, I don't bother um, with this fly doing the black or anything like that because the body's black. But if you want, you could build it up again if you really want to. Um, I just find with when I tie black pertagons, it's already got the black contrast. I feel like I'm kind of doing nothing. I'm just kind of doing it for the sake of doing it. I totally bung that up, but I'll just uh, tie it off. So that is a really good one to keep in your arsenal as well. Works year round, works everywhere. The original then had hens 45 uh, dubbed around it. They actually tied it like that and then dubbed it, but I like making it a Pertagon version. I won't hit it with the torch again because you get the idea. But that is a really, really, really good Pertagon. It's done, worked really well for me. And Chris, I think you've had equal success with it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a there's three Pertagons that you know keep a simple selection, have maybe one more in copper, good to go. But or have a lot of fun and make an army of them. <laughs> you can go crazy with them. They're pretty fun fly to tie, and they do fish really, really well. So any questions on Pertagons? How to fish them? When not to fish them? I will say they do fish slower than any other nymph as well. So another time to fish a Pertagon is you want a slower drift. They have nothing that's gonna grab any of. So even when we get down to that layer when we're rolling our nymphs on the bottom, anything with hackle is still gonna catch more water and move a little faster. Pertagons are kind of like a mop fly-ish in that they slow right down. So another time, just back pocket in your mind to use a Pertagon is I want a really slow drift. So cold conditions, fish are off. You really wanna get down in there and kind of Joe Humphreys would say, roll the bottom. They're a great pattern to do that. All right, one more nymph and then we'll get out of the nymph land. Um, so this goes by different names. I've heard it uh, called a March Brown. Uh, I, I've heard it called down more of a th called the thread nymph. I've heard it called an Anna, another one called a Martin Droz nymph. Uh, this would be if you opened any Czech competitors box from the Czech Republics, every single one of them has a variation of it. Lubos Rosa, who's a world champion, just wrote a, a book. He has it in there. It's a fantastic pattern, but I tie it two ways. Uh, I tie the OG way, or the original way right now, and then kind of a modern version, and I use it a bit different. So I'll go rip through those pretty quick. Um, so I like a copper bead for this one. Gold is an also a great uh, alternative. You can tie it in silver gold. Black, black bead is also really, really good. Um, don't be afraid to have various bead colors, but if I had to pick Two, I'd probably use a copper and a black, but I do tie this in multiple bead colors. 
Uh, thread is a little irrelevant, but so I'll just use black till this, this red's on, going to run out on me. I'll just get rid of it. Um, I, and you'll notice I do have it in a jig hook. So this is a jig wave. Um, I ran out of jig superbs. Oh, my thread is going to fall off. Um, but um, I do like, I, I, my preference is usually a jig superb, but the jig wave is good, even the jig original or whatever jig hook you like. But this one I tend to fish on the bottom. So when I'm using jig hooks, I use Waltz Worm is another one I use on a jig hook. Um, the reason uh, getting asked all like why do you use a jig hook versus a wet fly hook? These are flies I really want to bounce off the bottom. So if I'm fishing multiple flies, this will always be my point fly. Um, if I'm going to kind of ride up a little higher in the water column, like most of my other flies, I try to ride that cushion a bit more. I tend to move away from jig hooks, but jig hooks still work very, very well. So black thread, but thread is kind of irrelevant. Um, for this one, the original uses partridge. So I've got partridge right here. Um, tail, I just use tied just the way the original was, which was clump of partridge feathers, length of the body. Okay, we're not worried about being ultra, ultra thin with this one. Some folks tie it pretty scruffy and pretty, pretty thick, but I'll keep it in the realm of not too thick. Um, the rib is glow bright number five. The brand is glow bright and the color is number five. That's kind of a pretty popular uh, color for a lot of things. You'll see it, if you don't know glow bright, it goes from zero to about 13 or something like that. Five being kind of a really nice, kind of like that fire orange color. Uh, four being a little bit more of the red um, and bright. Uh, and seven's a real kind of, I was going to say, or, gonna say orangey orange, but I don't know what that means. But uh, like just more of a lighter orange. All three of them can be very, very good. But if you, had, if you picked one color that is considered used across fly fishing as one of the best colors, it's the glow bright number five. It's almost the exact color of fire orange uni thread. So again, don't lose, if you don't have it, use an orange rib, use whatever you have. So I've just tied that in. It's gonna be used as a rib. Here's your body. All those who know me go, what a surprise. He's using Hare's ear dubbing number one. Um, Chris told me they don't make it call. It's not called this anymore. Um, yeah, what do they call it? I think they just call it light Hare's ear now. Okay. But it's been so, really, it's, it's odd. It's been really hard to come by um, lately for, for some reason. So if anyone needs a sub, I mean, I've just been suggesting if people want, they could probably take some white Antron, a clear Antron and cut it up and mix it with the favorite Hare's ear dubbing. Probably yeah, same. yeah, good point. Or, or I mean, if yeah, if you're, or just use hairs there if you like. I mean, but uh, yeah, what I like about this has a bit of antron in it. Um, that's me. The original is just tied with hairs there. Um, but um, it's a good point. You could just chop up some. All it has is chopped up antron in it, anyways. Um, so I'm, I'm ribbing. I don't know what to say. Kind of not too thin, not too thick. Just kind of a normal piece. Uh, of, of dubbing rope. Um, again, some people tie this one really, really bulky. I don't like it as bulky. Um, and then just twist the, the globe right. And you can either spin the vise or do it the other way you want. And we're just ribbing it with that globe right. And what's amazing when the fly gets wet, that ribbing really does stand out. Now you'll notice I left room uh, between the bead and the dubbing. Now, if you wanted to just give up right now and fish that as a fly, a lot of people do, great fly. Kind of a case caddis, got a hot orange hot spot on it, go for it. Um, I like to just right now myself, brush it out a little bit. I'll go overboard, but kind of just scruff it up a little bit. And then we bring in, the partridge comes back. And those who know me, I'm already using way, way too many um, pieces of material. So this is about as involved as my flies get, but it works really, really well. So it's worth it. Um, there are a ton of variations of this. And all I've done is tied that in just like your classic wet fly, wrap it around a couple wraps. And I wouldn't be too worried about 
you know, is it one wrap versus two? This one, you kind of want bulky a little bit. Like we're, so we're fishing this close to the bottom. Um, it's not a, it's the opposite of a Pertagon. It's got a lot of movement baked in. This is a great jigging fly, or if you want to strip little nymphs or anything like that, it's got wet fly appeal, right? So it's just like a wet fly with a bead in front of it. So everybody see that okay? So it looks like, like a big mess, but in the water, there's a ton of movement in that. Looks, I can see why it's called a March Brown. Uh, and then for the, right in front of the bead, um, the checks would dub it with hens 45. Um, here's a, here's a mix I do is just peacock ice dub and black peacock ice dub. It's kind of the exact same. Um, good enough. If you've got black ice dubbing, whatever, something with a little bit of glint to it. Um, the key being like we just talked about before it gives a black collar. So I think more than the glint is that little bit of a, of a, of a collar and it makes a big difference. I've tried it without it. It makes a big difference. It's not the dubbing as much as it is. It's a bit of a glint and a little bit of a hot spot. So that fly right there is money in the bank all over the world. Uh, I don't think you'd find many competitive anglers at the world level that don't use that fly. And there's a reason they do that. But I find here, it's a great fly year round. I don't know what it imitates, just buggy. So that right there, OG thread nymph. All good on that one? Yeah, we could. And were you going to tie the variant or? Oh, yeah, we're going variant okay. now. Okay. So here's the variant. So this one, uh, like everything, everybody puts variants on it. Don't forget about the original. That's all I'm saying. Like, don't, uh, if it matters, I've got Lubosh's book and L Lubosh still fishes the original and he's, I mean, that guy thinks like a fish. So, but this is a very popular variation. I like having both. I just fish them different. This one I like with the pink bead. Um, I also love pink beaded flies. Uh, I think pink, pink beads, this is the soft pink, not the electric pink. I think like the soft pink is, is kind of like a less, is more subtle than copper. Um, it's a pretty subtle bead. Uh, it works really, really well. There's something about, especially in that tea colored kind of water, it does work really, really well. So I wouldn't call the pink beads gimmicky. There are a lot of gimmicky bead colors. Don't shy away or don't be afraid to tie some of your favorite patterns with a soft, whatever it's called, just pink. But that soft pink color, I would absolutely recommend having your favorite flash with a bit of that. Yeah, I think Hannah calls it uh, the light pink metallic one. There you go. And that's, uh, is that right here? Yep, metallic, light pink. You're correct. Bang on. Uh, all right. So same fly, but just streamlined a little bit. And so you could totally use partridge for the tail. But the variation has, you guessed it, Coke de Leon. Uh, so, so, I mean, it's again, a barred tail. I have seen variations with a tag, like a pink tag. And for grailing, they'll put like little pink tags on it and stuff like that. I like the OG kind of just a simple tail on it. So this is just a Coke de Leon tail. Same, a little bright. Number five. Okay. Not as worried about keeping it thin, so we can get a good thread base. Pick your favorite hairs here. Getting a little nervous, Chris, now that if I run out of this, I can't, can't get any. All right. Dub it in. Oops, overdid it. Okay, again, leave a little bit of space. Twist the glow bright. Grab it all the way out. All right. Now this one, instead of the, uh, and you'll notice I'm doing this one, uh, I didn't point out on a, not on a jig hook. This is on a regular wet fly hook. I do fish this one as a top dropper. 
I don't even worry about inverting the bead. You can invert the bead if you want. Um, this one, I just, it's always my top dropper. I don't fish it on the bottom. If I'm fishing closer to the bottom, I use the other one. Doesn't, again, I'm not saying you have to do that. It's just what I do. Um, so then grab CDC. And you want, you know, any of your standard CDC feather. And all we're gonna do is do the exact same thing we did before. Hackle it in. So, oops, try to do that properly. Let's try that again. Catch it. Hackle it in. So the CDC being a little bit softer look. I'm just pulling it out. And again, I don't lose a ton of sleep on how many wraps. It's whatever you like. Like I, I'm, I don't know. I'm not convinced it's going to make that much of a difference. Done a really bad job of, of tying that in there, but who cares? Uh, so tie this back. That is a horrible job of tying in that CDC. There we go. Okay. So you got this nice CDC collar there, and it's just like the, the other one. We just put that little drab hotspot in the front and off we go. I'm just cleaning up here and there we go. So again, your favorite black ice dubbing. And I would say this has become more popular than the original. I see this a lot more than the other one, but they both work really, really well. And uh, I do really like this in a pink bead. Um, and for those, you know, I like the pink bead hairs here. This has got, you know, this is not the same to me. It's got like the hot orange in it. It just, it's got a little more pizzazz to it. So a little more of an attractor type pattern. So, and if you really want to trim it back, you just go like this and pinch your fingers at the back if you're worried about flyaways, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's supposed to have movement baked into it. So. That is the kind of the modern view of the, the thread nymph. Both of them work exceptionally well. And that's about as far as I get with, uh, with materials. That's a lot of materials in that one. So Ian, you say you like that one as a top dropper. Do you tend to tie it a little smaller, a little lighter than the other one? Yeah, depends. Yeah, like I'll have this in a, on a 2.53, you know, and sometimes three and a half. I have it all for depending on how fast the water I'm fishing. But I just like, I like this one to fish as a top dropper myself. Uh, but as a single fly, I'll, I'll fish it as well. But I do uh, lighter, but I don't go super light on my, I don't go huge variation between uh, my flies. So, but I do tie a lot with two, 2.5 mil beads. So I, I think for some people that feels quite light for a bead. Nice. Yeah, I've actually noticed a, a lot more people seem to be buying 2.5, so. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah, because, you know, I think. I think we're just getting better at nymphing. So we realize, okay, we don't need as much weight to get it down, but there are times where you definitely will. So that's thus the various. Uh, and then if as a single fly, but that is a beauty. If you don't have one, definitely think about it anyways. All right. So that, that ends the nymph portion of this sequel event. Um, any questions just generally on nymphing or anything I could answer before I jump into everybody's favorite dry flies? Uh, again, nothing that I'm seeing at the moment, but if people want to revisit the topic, if they think of something, feel free again to drop a question in the chat. We'll get around to it. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, if, oh, wait. Uh, Hang on. Okay. Hold Corey. on. Okay. Holding. <laughs> From Corey. Um, uh, yeah. So I think um, you'd probably say you probably carry a pretty similar box no matter where you are, but any good patterns for searching new waters? Yeah, like, I mean, like, yeah, so I mean, or what's your general philosophy, maybe, you know, um, like for, yeah, so I mean, first, so if you walk up on the river, so first thing, um, what time of year is it? So spring, summer, uh, winter, fall, depending on where you live. Uh, first thing I do is take a water temperature. So number one thing that's going to dictate where fish are and their behavior is the temperature. So uh, one thing you should never go fishing without is a thermometer. So get a digital one. Don't make as many fish digital ones anyways, but you can find industrial ones on Amazon or whatever, but whatever it could take to get, take a temperature. 
So quick temperature lesson, uh, 55 to 65 is kind of the prime range for trout. Uh, 58 for a rainbow is like spot on perfect. 61 for a brown, 55 for a brook trout, but whatever. <laughs> 55, especially 55 to 60, that their metabolism's in full swing. They can be anywhere in the river. They'll be in the fast, low, slow, whatever. Um, if you get into kind of below 55 for 45 to 55, they tend to not be in the fast riffles as much, kind of the slower portion of the water. If you get below that, that's when you find them in the deep pools and stuff like that. You get into over 60, I'll tend to look in the riffles and stuff like that. So simple way of when I approach a new river, new river I just look at the, okay, what, what's in front of me? Do I have fast water, slow, whatever, temperature? I don't care what the river is. That's where I think I might find the fish. And then next is what am I fishing for? So am I, I will assume trout, but what kind of trout? Brook trout, rainbow, brook, don't know. Okay, that's different. But if you have an idea, okay, it's a brown trout river. Well, they're going to tend to be closer to the edges. They like structure. They don't like as fast water as a rainbow trout. If it's a rainbow river, I'm going to probably skew still more to the riffles, probably a little more middle of the, the or, or runs and stuff like that. And brook trout really like structure as well, but they can kind of, um, and they're, you know, you know, they tend to be close to structure, but like fast water. So general, I'm just generalizing, but that's what I go through. Next thing I would do is look at the color of the water. Is it clear, off color, tea colored, whatever? What color is the bottom? So if the bottom is light, I'm grabbing a hair's ear for sure, because it's light. If it's a darker bottom, probably a pheasant tail, or I'll be really clever and put a lighter colored fly in another one. If it's tea colored water, I'll probably start with a silver bead. If it's clear water, start with the copper. And we'll kind of go from there. Um, and I think that would probably be it. I might flip over a rock if I'm really feeling exciting to see what's on there, but it's probably going to be what we know is there caddis and mayflies time of year. Hit a couple bushes before you walk in, see what flies out. If you see a couple caddis fly out, great. So if you got a dry fly rod, you're going to fish dries. You got an idea, throw a caddis on or something like that. That's what I would probably start with. And then I put my confidence nymph on either this thread nymph, I'm fishing a hair's ear or a pink bead hair's ear. And if I'm fishing pertagons, I'm going to put, I guarantee you, I put on the gasolina and the rainbow warrior because I cover two. Um, that's how I kind of start. And then I just work from there. And I actually wouldn't change flies as much very early, but beyond kind of covering water. If it's later in the early in the season, I, I would fish 14s, maybe even 12s. If you're getting into the kind of closer to summer, 16s, eight into summer, 18s. Um, some uh, that would be my kind of just general size selection. So sorry, Chris, I put a lot in there, but uh, that's how oh, I that's think. awesome. I love that you uh, you left the flipping of the rock till almost the very last there. <laughs> yeah, because I don't care. It's not going to change anything I do. Like so, I'm the opposite. I wouldn't. I just because I've got I'm a generalist fishing. Uh, you know, if there's uh, I could get caught if they were really onto a hatch or something like that, but I'd probably see it. And I, you know, that, you know, I would just, and you like, I like, well, you got to start with something. So you start yeah. and then work from there, but you know, a lot of it's location and coverage don't go. Uh, I, it's more about the type of water, how I most effectively fish it. Um, and then also, am I going to fish active or really slow presentation? Probably based on water temperature. Or water temperature. Yeah. And you could probably throw maybe just some local knowledge in there too. You know, is it a, a tail water is bug life likely to be smaller you know, do I know from reports that I hear this is a highly pressured, you know, super tough fishery or, I mean, we don't really have those around here. Yeah, good point on the tail water. Uh, very good. Uh, you know, what type of, uh, I should have, like the right answer to the book would have been, is it freestone? Is it a tail water? You know, where, you know, like, are, how are they, you know, how are they going to relate to the various structure? Is it a big river, a small river, stuff like that? But um, don't be afraid to kind of just compartmentalize it. Don't get, um, in my opinion, chasing entomology and has charts. Just take a look at it. They're handy to look at. Okay. They got a, like the grand Hendrickson's are coming off, you know, in May. Great. What size are they? 14. What'll work? A pheasant tail. Good. Probably drift that a bit. Okay. Before that hatch starts to come off. Uh, what else I see? Sow bugs or isopods. Yeah. A hair, little hair zero probably cover that. I'll rotate through those two nymphs for the morning until I see the water temperature increase and some bugs may be moving and I'll just go from there. I think thinking that way and then, okay, try my next nymph. I'm, I'm more bead color. I got five yep. nymphs that'll work and two different sizes. I'm just going to rotate till I hit a fish and I'll fish it. Yep. 
yeah, and that's that's it. that's that's how I've changed completely versus in my head going, oh my god, I've got the wrong fly. Don't get hung up on that. Like there's a very small that about 10% of the time the fish are like honed in and will only eat a single thing. And we all know when that is, it's when they're rising around you and you can't catch them. That's the time uh, that they're usually really keyed in on something specific. It's a very small, but like the bass guys, when they're busting shad, they're actually the hardest to catch, but 90% of the time, the rest of the time, they'll throw 10 different things at them. Yep. Love it. All right. Does that hopefully uh, Corey, that answers your question. If not fire another question, that was a good one. All right, dry fly time. It's going to be super underwhelming because I don't fish. I only fish like five dry fly patterns, and I've tied most of them. But these these are these are good ones. Um, the first one. Now I've tied a lot of f flies and caddis. Like you, caddis patterns are good, especially around here. Um, just a general thing with cat. I'm, I'm tying a fourteen. You know, all the way down. You can tie them to twenties, and you know, an f fly you can tie. I've tied before all the way down to really really small, but in general, 14, 16s will get you by, but don't be afraid of big caddis patterns. I'm not going to tie one right now because I'm tying them, past, but 12s, 10s, fantastic searching pattern. So if you're going to fish a dry fly like a streamer, meaning I'm just going to cover water and try to raise a nice brown trout, um, put a 12 on or something like that. Uh, I've, I've fished size six stimulators on the grand all the time. Like that, that's a pulling dry fly. We're saying, hey, they're going to look and go, yeah, I'll eat that. And there's big caddis and that fly around all the time. But for your general, just I need to cover what's probably hatching all the time. Size 14 caddis. This one's kind of hard to beat as a general pattern. Um, so I'm going to tie it quickly with black. Yeah, um, I got some little olive thread here. The thread color is completely irrelevant for this one. But I'll tie it with uh... so thread of choice, but I would say, in my opinion, go relatively thin on your thread just to keep a nice clean body. This one's just completely a CDC caddis fly. Um, I think I've seen it called the mole fly. I don't know why. Um, it's a really, really good pattern overall. So um, all we're going to do on this one, take the bottom part of your CDC of any feather, just strip it off dub dub it on the thread hopefully it'll stay and so you could you could substitute hair's ear and do whatever you want um, this just gives it a really natural you know, look and floatability there we go there we go so that's just cdc body and if you're like me, I'm already getting bored. Are we almost done? Don't worry, we're almost done. So now we just grab a couple quality CDC feathers. Um, I go like I go like three for this. Um, I probably go a little heavy, that heavier than most. I don't know. I, I find uh, I like my I like to be able to fish this in faster water CDC. So I've just been able to. All I've done is put those tip to tip, all facing. If it's was it concave, like you know, if they like that, I've just lined them all up concave or whatever you want to say it and it lined up, they're not opposite. Yeah, they're, they're, just, they're just not flaring out from each other. Yeah, they're not flaring out from each other. So, and then I just grab that as much as I can from those tips, and that's going to be the wing of my cat. So, this is your you know, and what you want is just slightly over the bend, uh, bend of the hook. So, tie it in. So, you know, you could call is that an F fly with you know, with a CDC body, sure. Um, so if you wanted to be a real fancy pants, you could, actually I'll show you something cool with CDC. Um, it picked up, uh, so if you, I think I showed this before, but called, it's a bead thing, it's called Threads app. <laughs> you can buy them on Amazon, they're a little for beading. I don't know what they do with this thing, but it, uh, it's got a little heater on it. So if you ever end up with the CDC and it's in the, kind of the eye like that, you just take this, hold it, and it heats up, and it just takes away all the. Well, if it heats up, it will. Or the batteries are dead. There we go. There we go. So it'll just burn, burn off that CDC. Just an easy way to clear the hook eye if you ever need to. So you could be done, fish it like that. 
If you're a fancy pants, you could split the thread, put the CDC, another CDC and wrap it around for a really pretty fly. Um, but this is guide fly day. So, you know, with your cut tips here, by the way, you can start to use these for your next body, but take the one with the nice long spindly things. And this would be like, if you wanted to, again, split the thread, all you fly tires out there, do it. It looks great, but I just take it, dub it, wrap it around the head a couple of times like this and pull back and tie off. And then what I'm going to do after that's done is just, um, once we tie this off, I haven't crowded the head too much. Um, I will show, we'll just brush that out. I could do it right now. So you take your, and we're just going to pluck that out a bit. And what you get is a, whether you call it legs or whatever, it's a little bit of extra CDC at the, at the front end. So when you want to tie off, what I've been doing with these dry flies, I find it's a little easier. Instead of doing the um, whip finish, is if you grab a pen, you can just do a half. You can do your hitches really, really fast without having to mess about too much. So just you know, do what you want, but throw a little bit of glue on there and just throw a half hitch, and off you go. And that is a really basic CDC pattern. But that is an amazing fly. <laughs> um, floats really, really well. Great pattern. And you can see it's super, I don't know, there's something about all that CDC flighting around. It looks really, really natural. Use that year round for any seat. Like it's fantastic. Pretty good. All Love good. That. All right, um, Chris, I pulled this one. I don't think you've seen this one, Chris. You might have. I don't know. I've tied a lot of flies around you. Um, so this is uh, my friend. Uh, I did go through my fly box to go, okay, there's got to be a dry. I haven't tied. And I think I just missed this in my, this is no, this is no, uh, just because I haven't tied it, it's not that it's not a great fly. So I'm tying this. I like this on the Clink Hammer 390 BL. If I hook that one and the other one, uh, by the way, the other one I took, I, uh, I mean, use your favorite drive. You look at the picture, like the other one was flat. This one's got a real curved look to it for the, for that clink hammer type of pattern. Um, my friend, Dave Downey out in Scotland, uh, it's one of his patterns. Um, I just call it the simple olive. I'm sure he has a better name for it than that, but it is a simple olive and this fly <laughs> works extremely well also on still water. It's a really, really good still water pattern, but it's also a really good, I mean, if you have pressured fish, this is a great one. So I've got olive vivis, that darker olive. I tend to like it in the darker olive pattern. I lost my hook, but I'll put another one. Um, that darker olive pattern uh, color, then the light olive um, that I tend to, I personally just like to look better. I was showing the fly this way um, and, uh, it just seems to, I don't know if it fishes better, but I certainly have more confidence in it. Uh, Dave won uh, a Rivers Championship in Scotland solely using this fly. I can see why it works really, really good. Super, super, super simple. So the body, just all of thread. Oh, well, we're going to go down. And so when I said it's a nice subtle pattern, you got to think that's a really natural thin body going down. So Again, don't be afraid to do a couple wraps. Like we're just trying to give a distinct body here, but and about halfway, you can see down the good good ways down the bend of the hook because we're going to chew up the top a little bit. Okay, so back up to the top, grab our CDC again. And about again three. Like I, some people go really light on the CDC. They're convinced that it's makes it a more natural pattern. I just like my flies to float. So um, I don't lose the sequence. So I've just done the exact same thing, but like you normally you'd put a caddis wing on like that. We're going to reverse it the other way. So I tied a fly called the plume tip um, for one of these without a pheasant tail body by Jeremy Lucas. It's the same kind of idea. It's like a shuttlecock. So if you see, I've got the, essentially the length of the hook and I'm just tying it on the top. 
kind of like that. So notice, leave room here that you can push that back. The secret with this fly, and then you just trim it on an angle like that. The secret with this fly is actually when is the angle you want it to sit about like that. Um, and then you just uh, grab um, your favorite kind of spiky dub. So I'm using SLF squirrel dub, but whatever, spiky hair's ear, whatever. Just I like, you want it a bit spiky. And you know, I like the SL, this SLF stuff also has Antron in it. Clearly I'm a sucker for Antron, but I'm not sure that makes a big difference in this one. But what I do like is that spiky look right there. So you can see, gives the fly a really good look. And then we're gonna come in front and push that wing up a bit. And so just wrap your thread up towards. So if you can see that now that it's not sitting quite forward, it's almost, I don't know what angle that is. I wouldn't say 45, but um, we're gonna see that it's gonna sit in that, that film, just like an emerger. And it, like, it looks like a little olive emerger. This is a deadly fly in really small sizes too. So don't be afraid of an 18. Don't even be afraid of a 20. So well, I did all whip finish this one. You can do it real. So that fly there, the simple olive, I forgot to tie at these, but uh, definitely uh, a great pattern. And I would fish this anytime throughout the year, just in various sizes. As I said before, it's a, it's a really subtle pattern. It's really nice and you're right. You found one that I had not seen in your box yet. Yeah, and I've got a lot of these. And so that's that's a really, it's just a forgotten one. I just didn't tie it. But when I went through my box, I had about a hundred of them. And I'm like, I never tied that one. So if you see that, you could put a tail on it. I, it, it looks, you know, if you can see it, what a fish would see, it sees that. So it does fish like an emerger, but it is fantastic and really, really subtle. That's nice. And sorry, just because uh, I'll make sure we get thread color right. Is that the olive or is that the olive done? It looks kind of grayish. Yeah. Z11, here I'll get the color name. Yeah, I think that's the olive done. So it's a little more grayish than just the straight olive. Yeah, it's a dark, I call it a dark olive. I just grabbed it because I thought it was dark olive, but yeah, dark. <laughs> sure, olive done. C11, yeah. Is it is it all of done? Is it, is it yeah? Let's see. Oh no, you're right. It it do just call it dark olive. All right. All right. A little different in the uh it's weird. Vivas threads vary a little bit, uh, even when they have the same color name and different sizes. It's funny. But, yeah, it's nice. Dark olive. But you whatever, whatever, you, whatever thread you have, I'm I mean, I wouldn't be if oh, I don't do okay, it, but black would probably work pretty good too. And then the last one, did you say I've tied the championship caddis before? In an Instagram stream, but unless people were watching live, they wouldn't have seen it. So let's okay. do it. I will do an inst uh, a championship caddis. It's, uh, da, 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 da. we'll do it on 14. So back to this kind of hook. Um, I like this one, not small. So 12s and 14s. This is a good, this one, I had a bigger hook, I'd tie it, but this is a really good, a little bit of a tractor. It's a great brown trout fly. Very, very good. Um, and why it's called the championship caddis. I can't remember where the world championships were, but the winning, the top three teams all were using the same version of a caddis and they all, you know, did very well in the championship. So it got named the championship caddis. The original, they, they kind of weave the, the tail. It's irrelevant and a waste of time. So I don't do it. Um, so back to our globe right number five, same piece we had before, except for this time, we're going to fold it a couple times and I'm just folding it over itself and I'll, I'm going to grab a bigger piece so I can show you guys. If you don't have globe right, are you able to get globe right back or is it still delayed? It's been back ordered for ages. We have some other colors, but five has been sold out um we'll get it again when it becomes available but in the meantime there is a hens uh neon thread it's like fluorescent orange color it's it's pretty close it's about as close as i've seen okay and the other one that works really good is it for those of you who have the old um glow glow yarn mm. steelhead orange is essentially that yeah. color yeah that'd be good 
Yeah, so, uh, and then just fold it a bunch of times, right? So, okay, so there we go. And so all I've made is a little kind of a rope with it. And so you're gonna tie this in the full length of the body. And I'm doing that just for a balanced body. There's no other reason for it. There we go. And again, right back to the bend of the hook. Now I'm using olive thread, doesn't really matter. I'd, I'd probably use black normally, but, and then the tag, don't go crazy on the tag, just pass, just to the hook bend. So you want that little hotspot orange tag. Um, I'll clean up a little bit here. Those, I wonder what I'm gonna dub it with. I'm gonna mix it up, use the SLF spiky dubbing, but you can use, Here's your number one as well. Both work equally well. I do like this uh, having a little bit darker body. Uh, it's probably one of the rare times I don't dub with that. But again, any type of hair dubbing was the original, but, and I don't overdo it with it. Um, I just, I, I, I really like a little bit of Antron in my dubbing, obviously, but there we go. And then it's just, uh, so that, that being the key part of the fly, because the rest is the same as what we've done. So the original what did have CDC with elk hair over the top, but I just find I'm fishing less and less elk hair. Although Moro on this call, he sent me some of my favorite flies. He CDC'd a bit of them, but he ties a killer elk hair pattern. And so he's got me re-inspired on elk hair. Um, so um there we go his pattern is too complex so i buy it off him <laughs> so talk to moro on this call if you want uh some of his uh, killer dry flies but uh for elk hair you could put an elk hair wing over top of this um for sure um i just do cdc i find it works just as well and i'm just used to it so again just past the 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 hook bend tie it off there we go. And again, I use this um, a little more of an attractor pattern, but I find don't be afraid of it. Like it's uh, that little hot spot, even if like back to the, Chris, you're saying heavily pressured waters, whatever. Like I'm with you, like I would fish this in heavily pressured waters all day because you don't necessarily know people have fished what you've fished, um, at least to try it. And so again, if you want to clear the hook, I get a little bead thing going. It's not working as well as I warn it. And that's it. That's the championship caddis. And so, you know, the base being get pretty good at your caddis. Uh, with it with CDC, mess around with the bodies, but a CDC body. And this one can make a, you know, I've got an, more of an attractor type pattern. And then I've got a, a real subtle one with the CDC. So that is Jamie Jip Caddis. Dip. Pretty easy. And that, that's a really, that makes a big difference, a little hot spot. So I would say have a few dry flies with some hot spots, no different than nymphs. Like we got subtle, natural, and then a little bit of an attractor fly. Now I don't have a great reason of when I use one over the other, but if I'm really fishing, like fish are really on natural, they're rising, that's when I'm gonna pull up my really, really natural stuff, or I feel they're really been pressured by, by um, flashy patterns, but otherwise, I'll throw a hot spot through just like I did in the nymph. Did that work? No, let me try one with a hot spot. Okay, they're not eating the cat is size 14. Let's try something else. You know, rotate through a couple. Again, not having too many patterns is kind of the secret, just confidence patterns and keep rotating. All right, I only have one fly left, Chris. Motoring through them. What do we got? I'm a, oh, it's, it's almost 9.30. Um, it is the coffee bean fly. Oh, wow. Uh, so 
we've hit rock bottom. Like this is how we know we're at the end of the, the fly box when we hit the coffee bean flies. Uh, so um, they work really good. Um, really good. They're just only thing they don't, they fall apart in the guide fly. They're definitely easy. They're, they're just not that durable. So a fair argument would be, well, why don't you use a foam beetle? Great question. Don't know. I <laughs> just use the, the uh, I got to find a good foam beetle pattern, I guess. So thread, black thread. Um, this is an interesting pattern. Uh, uh, Commonwealth team, I think it was over in Ireland or something. Um, and they, the local team bought all the coffee beans out of the store so people couldn't tie this fly i actually think it would be illegal in competition anyways technically chris because it's is it bait i don't know at the very but, least scented right yeah deliciously scented and keeps the fish awake right but uh so all i'm doing is building up a thread base and we're we're almost done so tie off and if you thought I was being clever when I said coffee bean fly, no, I'm gluing a coffee bean to the top of this. Um, so let me just, I think I missed that. So a couple half hitches, just get on with it. Okay. Two ways of doing it. You can, I was uh, epoxying it with a flex epoxy to try to keep the bean moving. Um, I sometimes just glue it. So I'll show you the glue version. So two options would be put a glob of like, flexi cement or i think there's different solar as that has a flex in it you can try that you get a little but problem with coffee beans is they're brittle so when i say coffee bean coffee bean so find your favorite coffee bean that fits your hook and the secret to coffee bean selection is making sure that little spine is pretty straight and so i've been using this golf uh, kind of super gel and so it's almost the same as epoxying stuff. So I just put a big chunk of it like that, like a good glob of it, and then just stick the bean on the top. You know, put it aside, let dry. There, <laughs> that's your coffee bean fly. Looks just like, it's, it's so good. So a couple, I know if you don't believe me, Couple things about this: a, they're super easy to tie. Um, they uh, they do they I mean they're you they do break off with fish like meaning they fall off and stuff. You end up with the hook. You just go back glue another bean on. Um, they a couple of re when you fish this fly, you want to slap it down. Like and the reason I think it works so well is I think they're attuned to the sound of a beetle hitting the water and the coffee bean is essentially the same kind of, I don't know, weight, aerodynamics of a beetle. It plops just like a beetle and you don't have to gink them or anything, it is float. Um, but that plop uh, and that silhouette, that's a beetle. Like it's, and it work, it's deadly. Um, and uh, so, you know, you'd fish this close to the bank, close to overhang. So if you're, you know, you get into the summer-ish or late spring, early summer and they're on beetles and don't be afraid, don't be afraid of terrestrials that. I mean, how long does it take you to glue five coffee beans? Uh, give it a try. It's surprisingly good. And I've been using it for like 15 years, but I, I can't find a really good way. I can't tell you there's a great durable way to do it. It's how to try to keep that coffee bean from slipping off, but this is as good as any. And, that's that, that, that's it. Once we hit the coffee bean, I'm out. I got, I got nothing. We're into food items that are in the fly box. So <laughs> that's what I got. So uh, any questions on the coffee bean? Anybody else fish one? Maybe I'll table that question. Any coffee bean anglers out there? I'm sure there's a couple of coffee bean anglers. I just don't know if they have them on the ends of their lines. Now, Chris, have you fished a coffee bean nymph before? No, no, I'm just messing. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I didn't even do that. <laughs> uh, have, you, have, have you fished the coffee bean? Oh, Shelly is asking what roast works best. That's a great question. I went with an Ethiopian on this one. Um, I do like kicking horse from BC, but uh, you definitely want a medium roast. Dark roast, <laughs> they won't touch it. It's just too heavy and it doesn't float. Maybe a little too brittle. 
Yeah, yeah. But uh, but it is a um, like all kidding aside, uh, it's a fun pattern to have, have in your box. Um, they laugh like I've learned one thing: coffee beans don't really. I didn't try to eat them, but they don't really go bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an army of these things in my box, and uh, um, yeah, there's probably better beetles to have. And then the other piece you can add is if you find them hard to see, if you get any type of fluorescent um, nail polish or any type of paint, you can just put a little dot on the top. So chartreuse orange, you can make them very, very visible. Uh, it works really, really well. So um, yeah, the, I'm, not, I'm not, it's not a joke pattern for sure. Don't treat it. It's uh, worth having in the box, but I just wondered if anybody's used one, um, but doesn't sound like it. <laughs> So that's that's kind of what I got, guys. Uh, I'm literally out of flies. That's all the flies I own, uh, pattern wise. Oh, well, it was a good run. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a great run, but I am back. Tying steelhead flies, yep. so we're out of yeah. So I'll be and then that, geez, uh, get ready for bags of flashaboo to go missing. So Chris knows the crap that I fish for steelhead. <laughs> and he's not kidding. No, uh, it is it is like you thought the coffee bean was stupid. Wait, you see my steelhead flies. Um, but uh, unless there's any questions, I'm happy to field anything before we wrap it up. Yeah, I don't think we have anything at the moment. If people want to slip a last minute one in there, go for it. Uh, yeah, I don't think we've set up a date for that uh, steelhead one yet. But um, I know your your steelhead fishing is just as innovative as your your trout stuff. So it's, it's going to be something that people want to see for sure, and we'll make it well known when that comes around. Uh, yeah, and I think I might be going out with Shelly. I might be going out with Shelly for some steelhead if that's the same Shelly. Right. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, like, yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, because we got we got ripped off last year by the weather. We I know it was a rough there. fall for booking things out on the, oh, the west end. Unbelievable. Yeah, and uh, just from a booking of enemies looking, it's booking up pretty fast. I am. Uh, Chris, I will be doing some river clinics as well. I'll be sending out some dates, both advanced. I'm going to do more as advanced river clinics and beginner, not just Euro, but kind of all encompassing how to approach uh, and fish a river with multiple techniques. So uh, if it's up your alley, I'll be uh, obviously letting Chris know and we'll be sharing that out. But I think with where COVID's going, hopefully we can get back into having uh, some on the river clinics. So looking forward to that. And I imagine you're probably booking up pretty quickly there. So if people do want to get out, for sure. And, uh, and, rather than and uh, my style is much more education based, but uh, you know, so uh, if, for those who want to learn, I'm, I, I get more excited when you tell me later you caught a fish without me, but we'll definitely, uh, yeah, booking up. Uh, I mean, people have the, it's like steelhead season every spring gets a, people get excited for it. So um, looking forward to steelhead season, but I love the trout season. So can't wait to uh, be on the river, but have reach out anytime. And also just with any questions, like I am, Anytime, happy to answer any questions you have, or if something triggers you want to know a, a tweak or fish this or any other flies, ne- never hesitate to reach out. I'm just not the fastest on text. I'm hurting. I heard texting is catching on. Uh, I'm uh, I'm about a day or two delay usually on both email and text, and that's just because I'm weak with technology on yeah. responding. Of course, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, they can they can go through the shop we'll pass you along or uh if you want i don't know if you want to put your email out there yeah my um can i just type in the chat i'll just type it uh so um oops i am tripping. yeah there you go just email me or call or text me at... we'll cut that bit out for the uh the public oh whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I've never tied a dry. Start whoever said that. Oh, Shelly, sure. try with the co- coffee bean, man. You can tie them all night and then uh, play, yeah, enjoy. That's Those are really, really that. easy one. The yeah. other one for Shelly is just an F fly, and an F fly is just a thread body with that caddis over wing. Yeah, that's and how, how you that. covered that in your yeah. CBC video. For sure. Like okay. if you had one fly to fish for a dry fly the rest of your life, it's an F fly probably. So. Yeah, for sure. All right. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you again. Great as always. And thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in there. And we'll see you again soon. Yeah, winter well, everybody. And I hope, I can't wait to see you on the river in the spring. It's getting close, guys. It's exciting. All right. Have a great night, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, Chris. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.